So the table's in the back. Can you hear me? I see some nods. Okay, okay. So uh, my name is Media Farzine, and I am so happy to be here. Thanks to Mark and the Frisk Museum team for being so lovely, and for Nashville for being so lovely. So I am uh, one of the contributors to the catalog. Um, and so what I am going to do today is just try to give you a summary of the essay that I wrote. And um, in that essay, I had my art historian hat on. And so I was trying to think about the developments in um, art history that might have led to the kind of approaches or some of the kinds of approaches that we see in this exhibition. So, when I first spoke with Mark about the idea of the exhibition and uh, some of the artists that he'd chosen and that he wanted me to think about, I had the feeling that there was really strong engagement with history in some of the works of these artists. And so looking at them, I saw that these were paintings that were really informed by abstraction and that was something that the artists were interested in. But I also felt that they were also trying to convey something about the human body and especially the human condition through that language of abstraction. And I really wanted to look at um, what the precedence of that might be, you know, where these ideas might be coming from and also how uh, what the artists are doing is new, um, how they're doing something different art historically speaking. So what I'm gonna sketch out today is a kind of what you might call a very subjective artistic family tree to try to give you some um, approaches to think about the rest of what we're gonna do today um, to look at the contemporary work. I also think it's maybe important to tell you when I wrote my essay. Um, Mark and I started talking about this. It was around the time of the last presidential election. And I remember I was kind of struggling to finish the essay right around the time of the travel ban where um, people were going to JFK. You know, I live in New York to protest and I was like, I have to stay here and finish this essay. Um, so I think that current events really affected how I was seeing this work. Um, I was thinking a lot about migration as a global crisis, and I was also thinking about history, um, how history is always a story, and how people like to tell this story in um, ways that sometimes become problematic, how stories are used to deceive or to exclude or to harm others. Um, but you know, so in a general sense, I was thinking about the relationship between art and politics and how the politics of our time can become a dominating force in the way that we think about who we are and um, what we do. So just to sort of point out that it's subjective. But also to maybe explain why I began with Jacques-Louis David and the grand manner. And David is, I think, one of the most grandiose painters of Western history but he's also one of our best known history painters, one of our most celebrated um, and arguably most successful history painters. So this is the Oath of the Horatii. If a lot of this seems like art history survey class, I apologize, I'm gonna try to be quick, but I'm trying to lay a foundation here. So Oath of the Horatii might be familiar to you because it's a very famous, um, Roman epic story, there's a war on in Rome, and the Horatii family that you see here are about to go to war to defend their family. So you have um, the father, you have the three sons, and you have the swords that they're about to take to go to war. Now, of course, there's a problem. <laughs> the problem is they are going to be fighting to the death with the Curatii family, which is kind of like their nemesis in the you know, opposing camp. And their sister, who is in a swoon on the right, is married to a Curatii man. And one of the brothers is actually engaged to a Curatii woman. So the men are gonna go to war, they're mostly gonna die heroically, but for the women it's gonna be a lose-lose situation. And what David is doing here, I think, is giving us a sort of very balanced image of the idea of sacrifice as a very important uh, element in the story and also what those sacrifices might entail. Now, I'm actually not interested in the painting's story. What I'm interested in is how this painting talks to its viewer or how it talks to its ideal viewer, which would have been a French, probably male, gallery-going citizen of 1780s France. 
Yeah. So this is a France that's on the brink of a really big revolution. It's cultural, it's social. This is a revolution that David is sympathetic to. And so in this painting, he is trying to confirm the values that he believes in and that he thinks his viewer believes in too. Yeah. So what he's trying to do is appeal to the viewer's sense of their own identity insofar as they see it in this place, in this time period, and in the characters of this story. Yeah, so the French people would come to the gallery, to the salon, they would look at this and be like, yes, I am descended from great men who are eight feet tall and they went to battle for their country and you know, we are good people. So ultimately this is a painting about patriotism. Yeah. Um, it's also a painting with a very clear message. Now you may be sitting there going, but I am a 21st century viewer and I look at this painting and I've seen it in the Louvre and it's really impressive and I don't necessarily take away the same message. We are sophisticated people who understand that we can see things on different levels. We can understand what it might have been in the 18th century and we can understand what it is today. And I would say, you are absolutely right. And you know who else agrees with you? Beyonce and Jay-Z. <laughs> this is a still from their music video, Ape Shit, which they released, I think, earlier this year as the Carters. And for the other two people other than me who are new to this, this video was shot in the Louvre, where you can see a lot of different paintings, including the David that I just showed you. Now, there's a lot that we could say about this painting and what's going on there, but I'm not necessarily gonna go into everything. Although I will say just briefly, I feel that what they're doing is, um, it's a sort of symbolic, uh, it's a way of them saying we have access to this kind of timeless luxury that the Louvre represents, which I think is actually important to the idea of history painting, that this is a legacy of um, a royal collection. And so for the Carters to be in that space is a sign of success. It's a sign of um, representing symbolically the kind of commercial but also cultural success that they've achieved. Um, couldn't help it. So this is another history painting. This is Jay-Z in front of um, Jericho's Raft of the Medusa. And so if you know the painting, it's a raft of shipwreck survivors. And at the very tip of this triangular composition, there is a slave who is waving to the shore where we see a teeny little ship. And we know that probably they're going to be saved. Um, and so he's standing in front of it and he's looking at it. And you can see also um, the size of the painting. And I would say, you know, so for a lot of people, the idea of this painting is that if the black man is saved, there's hope for us all. And I think that's exactly what Jay-Z is also trying to access here. Um, the representation of a black body, but also his um, presence in this museum and in front of this work. So another thing that I think is important is that the Carters are equating themselves with the artworks. Yeah, They're saying we belong in the Louvre and we upstage the Louvre. I just love this. Okay. <laughs> this is David's um, coronation of Napoleon in the background, which I think they spotlit because you actually see it pretty well and Beyonce and her dancers in the front. So in my essay, which I did write well before this video came out, I actually talk about a problem that I have with history paintings like the one that you see in the background. And my problem, actually the problem that I began with was scale. Um, unless you're Beyonce, these paintings really physically dominate you as a viewer. Yeah, it's called high art because once upon a time they would literally look down on you from a very high position. They stood in an elevated position in relation to you. And the idea was that the elevation wasn't merely scale, it was also about moral clarity. You are standing there, a muddled little human, unless you're Beyonce, and they're there with a very clear historic message that is going to elevate you and teach you something about who you are. And I think the power of the music video actually comes from their really savvy appropriation of this message against the grain. Yeah, so you have in that painting the stillness and the whiteness of the coronation of Napoleon, and in front of it, you have these really dynamic dancing black bodies. So there's the contrast 
But then there's also a doubling happening because in the image of Napoleon, you have that literal outsider who crowned himself and became the king of France. And I think in the presence of the musicians in the Louvre, you have the same kind of grab for power and um, a kind of cultural dominance. Okay, I'm not going into a tangent about music history, although I'd like to, maybe, this is Nashville. Um, I actually wanted to think about history painting in relation to contemporary painting and to think about what painters are doing differently now um, and you know, who else they might be inspired by. What is the path that brings us to the works that Mark was just talking about? So I'm gonna move away from the Louvre away from the 18th century to a point in history where I feel like the artist becomes more interested in the viewer as an embodied rather than a strictly moral subject. And that's what bring us, uh, brings us to Romanticism and J.M.W. Turner's slave ship. So again, a very famous painting. You've probably seen it. Um, it's a little bit, well, a lot smaller than um, the Oath of the Horatii, so I tried to make it a little bit smaller, which is unfortunate because we're losing detail, but. So the story is again um, a pretty awful one. Um, there's a captain of a slave ship who knows that he has insurance, but his insurance only covers him for those slaves that either die at sea or are, you know, lost at sea, right? Okay, so. He isn't going to be reimbursed if some sick people end up in the port. So he actually throws over not only the dead bodies, but also those who are ill and dying. And this was in the news right around the time that Turner was making this painting, and it was a big outrage. And so he's taken a very current event. But what's interesting is that he hasn't given us a very direct image of it. Most of this painting is taken up by this incredible um, sunrise or sunset that actually has a complete range from a snowstorm at the far left to a tip of a blue sky at the end. And then you have the water, the, the sun reflected in the water. And it's only when you look really closely that you see below the ship maybe a shroud, you see fish, then you see chains, you see arms, more fish, possibly a leg. And I have this incredible close-up of this corner that I'm gonna show you, where you can really see the kind what he's doing with the brushwork um, and the way that you have, you know, body parts, chains, but the fish looking incredibly human with their eyes kind of googling as they're about to eat these people, I guess. The one at the top right is amazing. Okay, so, what I was inspired by and what I talk about in this essay is actually the interpretation that the artist Hido Steirl has given us. And um, she considers this painting to be a challenge to the very foundation of the Western perspectival tradition. She makes an argument where this is a really important painting in it. So the same way that like, I have this problem of scale and moral clarity with David, she has a problem with the idea of rationality and the way that that's reflected in painting. Um, and she believes that Turner is one of the earliest painters to subvert that idea. So I'm actually gonna read a short section of her essay, and I'm gonna put this up because she actually describes it for us. This is an essay that um, Hido Steil wrote in 2011 called In Free Fall, a thought experiment on vertical perspective. Okay, so she says, in this painting, the horizon line, if distinguishable at all, is tilted curved and troubled. I love that idea of like a horizon line that is troubled, like it has an emotion. The observer has lost his stable position. There are no parallels that could converge at a single vanishing point. The sun, which is at the center of the composition, is multiplied in reflections. The observer is upset displaced beside himself at the side of the slaves who are not only sinking, but have also had their bodies reduced to fragments, their limbs devoured by sharks, mere shapes below the water surface. And there's something beautiful about how she brings us to see what is happening in the painting with her. Suddenly it's not a coherent painting, it begins to fall apart. At the sight of the effects of colonialism and slavery, Linear perspective, the central viewpoint, the position of mastery, control, and subjecthood is abandoned and starts tumbling and tilting, taking with it 
the idea of space and time as systematic constructions. Now, this is a power that Steyrl sees in the painting. This is obviously subjective. But to think that a formal kind of inventiveness is, is able to produce a critique of something that is so outside of the painting is something that I find really powerful. And I mean, this is a strange painting in that sense. Turner, who actually exhibited this during um, an anti-abolition uh, conference, I think, in London, could have given us a really direct um, moral message. But instead, he chose us to give this experiment and abstraction that has now become a really foundational work for understanding what would happen in the 20th century. And so what Steyrl, and I think through Steyrl, I see is that this is a work about the emotional impact of perceiving a politics. And it's a kind of challenge that is to a perspective that is you know, conceptual that comes through a perspective that is visual, which I find to be a really compelling idea. So moving forward, almost a century later, I feel like Francis Bacon specifically takes up this question of abstraction through the body. I think that he's working through a lot of the same ideas. Bacon wants to show the body, but the figures somehow never come together. The body's disturbing, it's violent, it's nauseating. Um, it's an expression of a certain kind of crude presence, a deformation, the, the animalness of the body. So this is a work that's called Three Studies for Figures at the Base of a Crucifixion. If you've looked at Renaissance paintings, you usually see in these depictions of the crucifixion these figures that have a sort of very polite, decorous grief. But here, we have these three bodies that are in no way polite or restrained. Yeah, their sorrow is this inhuman scream of agony. And I think that the most important detail about this painting, which we actually now consider to be Bacon's first mature work, is that it was exhibited in the spring of 1945, which was the same month that the first photographs and film footage of the Holocaust were released. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about theme and form in a second. Now, what I was trying to do in my essay um, was to continue this line of thought about abstraction and emotion by going through the interpretation of the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze in relation to Bacon's work. And the idea that he talks about a lot is what he calls the violence of sensation. So I'm going to show you a couple of quotes, and these we'll read together. Um, it's from his book, Francis Bacon, Logic of Sensation. So he says, what directly interests Bacon is a violence that is involved only with color and line, the violence of a sensation and not of a representation. And I have a little bit of a question whether those two actually have to be as a part, but I find the basic idea really compelling. It's a violence that is only in the color and line or is specifically in the color and line. What is painted on the canvas is the body, not insofar as it is represented as an object, but insofar as it is experienced as sustaining this sensation. So if it's a body, but it's not represented as a body, then you don't really see a body. What he's saying is that you see a body in its impact, in its reception, in its reaction to something. And then he actually gives us a quote from Bacon himself saying, I want to paint the scream more than the horror which is a little bit of a conflicting stance, I think, when you think of it, what I just said earlier, and that this is a painting that's coming out at the same time as people are seeing what's happening in Nazi concentration camps. Bacon is almost saying, I'm not interested in the horror, but I am interested in the scream. I'm not completely sure. I feel like some of what's happening here is that Deleuze, as a French philosopher, is trying to use Bacon as an illustration of a certain kind of thinking that is about forms of thought. But at the same time, I find it a really compelling way to look at a painting like this one, which is a fragment of a crucifixion, where we actually see the crucifixion itself as this kind of flying, winged, mouth thing and a relationship between two forms on what is possibly a cross or is possibly just you know a random city scene. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but I think that here you can see this idea of a deformity that is the sensation of a scream. Yeah? 
But of course, I still think, well, why would he choose a crucifixion? A crucifixion has a history of being the emblematic image of suffering in Western civilization. So I really think that he, what he's trying to do is um, capture the sensation while building on our memory of a certain kind of iconography. And I do have a close-up of this freaky one over here. Um, one of Deleuze's most persuasive quotes, I think, is that he says, Bacon's scream is the operation through which the entire body escapes through the mouth. Yeah, he doesn't say the body is represented in the mouth. It somehow escapes its bodiness through this image of the mouth. And so for Deleuze, the idea of escape is really important. It's a kind of critical operation where you can um, move away from any limiting situation, a limiting concept, a limiting politics. And here, I think that he sees the history of Western representation of the figure in a medic way as something that is limiting and that Bacon, as an artist, manages to move away from. Now, I don't want to set up a kind of opposition where it's like David bad, you know, Bacon, Turner, good. So I want to sort of move on to a couple of other examples just to open this up. This isn't necessarily a proper kind of art historical thing, right? I'm sort of picking through some images that I think will help us see what we're seeing in the gallery. But a natural one would be Jean Fautrier, who is working right around the same time, 1944. This is one image from his Hostages series. And again, a very dark story. It's 1944. So Fautrier was apparently, and I don't know how this works, he was voluntarily committed to a mental asylum during the war. Um, I think the story goes he just wanted to get away from Paris during the war, so he moved to this mental asylum, but it actually turned out that the Nazis were using the forest nearby to torture and kill prisoners, and he could hear the screams. And so right around this time, he made the series of paintings that he says were inspired by that. And they're extremely abstract. They're um, kind of defined by this buildup of paint that you see on the surface, and sort of... Um, fainter washes of red that people compare to dried blood. You sort of see a face, sometimes you see a body, but mostly you just see material. And um, the French poet Francis Ponge, when he first saw them exhibited in Paris a year later in 1945, described them as tumefied faces, crushed profiles, bodies stiffened by execution, dismembered, mutilated, eaten by flies. So for me, I think what's important is that people who saw these works didn't just see a removal from the world. They saw a visceral image of violence, and they reacted accordingly. So bringing it up to the 60s, this painting by Georg Baselitz, Big Night Down the Drain. So it's a whole series that he exhibited um, in his Berlin gallery, and the Office of the Public Prosecutor seized like, a big bunch of them because they thought they were obscene. And I think in some ways, well, okay, there is like a floating penis, but it's not entirely clear what the source of the obscenity would be. Most of the paintings show this sort of little boy figure. He's usually holding his penis. It's usually a large penis. His head is also very large, and he looks sort of injured. Um, and in some of these, he's wearing these brown shorts that people thought were reference to Hitler youth. And you know, now, the, looking back, most people consider this to be a sort of um, some way representation of the disillusionment of post-war Germany. But I think we see how there's a sort of um, impact of something on a body. It's a body that we are beginning to see, like the way these touches of paint are registering a kind of sensation that is not quite a representation, but is speaking to us I think on an emotional register, yeah? and, and bringing out reactions that lead to things like censorship as soon as they're seen. So this is a work that I find really moving. It's from um, Louise Bourgeois, I think actually her last series called Into the Infinity. It's a large series of print panels that she made a few years before she passed away. And so I wanted to have a sort of maybe not so um, thick, representation or approach to the topic. And I think that for many people, this series represents a lot of um, the ways that she approached work throughout her career. You see a lot of um, sort of fragmented female bodies that seem to be floating in space. Um, there's body parts, distorted limbs, what looks like hair or phallic objects. 
So throughout her career, Bourgeois was focusing really strongly on how pain and trauma are felt on a personal register, um, how violence is enacted on the body and on the psyche, and how you know the female psyche specifically registers these as fantasies, as projections, as sort of scenarios. And I think what's interesting about this series of panels is that they're not very large, but she actually wanted them to be exhibited in a way that would immerse the viewer so that you are relating bodily to the sort of bodily dismemberment that you see here. And I think someone working in the same um, lineage would be Nancy Spiro. This is one of her earlier works. It's from a series that she did during the early years of the Vietnam War, started in 66. And there's a lot of helicopters in them. Yeah, this one says, search and destroy. It's crashing into the body of a woman that is faintly sketched out in this sort of bloody um, splotch. And one of the things that I think Spear is really good at is at making the line really speak to us in very visceral ways. So this is just a drawing, but it's a drawing that uses the smudge, that uses the line, that uses the juxtaposition of the machine and the body to really effective ways. But also, you begin to see how the idea of a body in pain can be opened up symbolically to more social concerns. So here you have the equation of a violence against women and the violence of US imperialism abroad done it with, I think, a very light touch and a very light hand. Um, and Spiro talks about this series. Um, she says, I imagine these works as manifestos to protest the United States incursion in Vietnam. And then she says, they act on me like so many exorcisms. And I find that a really kind of compelling thought that she's speaking about this on a personal register, like it's a personal exorcism. But it, I think it actually communicates that. The way that we see it, something is brought up, something is important, something physical and also um, sensory. OK, so to bring us back to kind of come to the end, um, back to history painting, which is how I began, or the legacy of history painting. This is um, Gerhard Richter's funeral from his series October 18, 1977, which he did in 1988. This is known as the October Cycle. It's also known as the Bader meinhof paintings because they're about the imprisonment and death of the German Red Army Faction terrorist group. Uh, and they've earned him the dubious honor of the best art ever made about terrorism. I don't know how he feels about that. So this is a very blurry image. That's what we can see. We can't actually see much beyond the blur. And for me, I think what's important coming back to a clear image of history is the idea of moral ambiguity, is the idea of turning away from clarity. We have a literally unclear vantage point on a historic event. And so the interpretation of the painting is that it actually takes up a lot of the questions that people had in Germany in the late 70s and early 80s about what happened to these members of the Bader Meinhof group. Were they killed or did they commit suicide, which is how the story goes. Were they mistreated in prison or were they just um, imprisoned? Were they terrorists or were they revolutionaries? There's, there was a big debate about that. And so Richter's stance on the question is, you know, I don't know. Yeah? Uncertainty is the only thing that this painting shows us for sure. OK. So I'm going to jump now from my kind of historic section over uh, the way that I get to certain conclusions about the paintings in the galleries, and maybe we can talk about that later, to sort of summarize for you what my conclusion was. And my tentative conclusion was that in contemporary painting, we may have bodies, but we rarely have a people. What we don't have is a discernible national history of a single unified people. So this is what I mean when I call it history painting unpeopled. So I talk about how these are paintings that are often committed to a space that is between figuration and abstraction. And where we might have expected or seen clarity, now we see ambiguity. So the emphasis of the work becomes a bodily felt connection with a viewer. And so one of the later conclusions that I draw is that we might see this sort of work as an antidote to the pitfalls of patriotism. And to, to think of this as a sort of cosmopolitan image of forms of belonging, uh, forms of belonging that come through the lived experience of the people that are making the work. 
I thought of ending on a work of Alice, but he's going to cover that. So this is um, from a series that's also in the galleries. Um, so I just want to end on a couple of questions, just to point out that you know my interpretation is also subjective. The idea of seeing uh, these works in relation to history is not, um, it's not an authoritative position at all. So one question would be, is it even painting's responsibility to be a document of our history or our histories, even if it is on the register of emotion? Don't we run the risk of forcing these artists into self-representation, of embodying some particular flavor of cosmopolitan trauma? And I guess the last question is a little more predictable. What about the circulation of this work in an art market where everything gets united under the banner of economic value? You know, I am talking about the value of dissent, of violence, of difficulty, but what if that actually isn't what the work does for most people? Um, so maybe things we can talk about in the discussion. Thanks so much.